Welcome to the Drug Diversion and Opioid Crisis Webinar. This is our uh, 106th webinar at TMIT, our national research test bed. Uh, I'm Charles Denham, uh, the chairman of TMIT, and it's my pleasure to be uh, your uh, host today. The first thing I'd like to do is take you to slide three for those of you that have the slides, and just make sure that you have your WebEx volume all the way to the max and your computer volume and speaker volume to the max. And if you don't have good audio, I'm on slide four for those of you that have the slides, click on participants and you'll see an icon in the lower left corner of the square and click on the phone and we'll give you a direct phone line so that you can have a better, uh, a, a better, better audio. And I'm on slide five for those that have slides and those that don't, this will tell you how to find them. If you go to www.safetyleaders.org and click on the upper right quadrant where it says what's new, you'll be able to see this webinar for September 21st. And if you click on that, you'll get to a page uh, which is slide six that those that are viewing the webinar right now will see. And when you see that, you'll see our lead speaker, um, and she will, uh, her picture is there, and also there'll be the ability to download some articles and in future other information and then be able to come back and watch the webinars. Here is where you'll be able to download the slides as well that we have. I'm now on slide seven, and on slide seven there are the addresses for social media. Slide eight is our purpose statement. Uh, and our purpose is we'll measure our success by how we protect and enrich the lives of families, patients, and caregivers. And drug diversion is one where the, there are multiple victims. We just had a good conversation with our speakers uh, before coming on, and we really recognize that not only are our uh, caregivers at risk with diversion, our patients are, and the community as well. Our mission is to accelerate performance solutions that save lives, save money, and create value in the communities we serve. And we believe that this is definitely that area. Uh, our disclosure statement is on slide nine. Please read it. Uh, however, uh, uh, and we just we, we have Kimberly New, who is a specialist in controlled substance security and DE regulatory compliance as a consultant. So we want to declare that for sure. But there is nothing else uh, to disclose. And our, the rest of our speakers are. Uh, uh, we will not be talking about any product, service, or technology. Our speakers and reactors who I'll introduce shortly are Kimberly New, who is our lead speaker today, Chief uh, Bill Adcox from MD Anderson and the UT uh, Police Department in Houston, Texas, Dan Ford, our longtime national patient safety champion who will open for us, Dr. Greg Boats, the press professor of anesthesia and critical care uh, at MD Anderson, and I'll be your host. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Dan Ford. Uh, Dan is a terrific champion of patient safety. He's a published author. Uh, we engaged Dan to be one of the patient safety leaders that helped write the sections for the National Quality Forum Safe Practices. He served on numerous committees uh, uh, nationally and locally, continues to contribute his time to patient safety, and he's part of the team that meets uh, that we have the honor of working with every other week, uh, Saturday mornings, to, do what, to identify areas to focus uh, on. He has a deep passion for patient safety, having had uh, uh, a patient adverse event in his family. And so, Dan, would you please open us with a, a, short, uh, a short message to help us ground our focus and, and, and guide us? I will, Chuck, and I appreciate uh, uh, being involved uh, once again, Chuck. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody, everybody in the audience, all the faculty. Um, the reason I am a patient safety advocate and the reason for my passion is to do with an opioid overdose uh, in my family. Uh, my first wife uh, has permanent brain damage, permanent short-term memory loss. It's a level playing field. It happens to everybody. Uh, it's an ethical, criminal, health, cultural, social issue, among a whole lot of other things. And uh, with that, I hope that each one of you will learn a bunch out of this and get motivated and go back and do something about it. Basic principle in high reliability organizations is mindfulness. And this is something we have to be incredibly mindful about. Thanks, Chuck. 
So thank you, Dan, and God bless you for your work. You are uh, just a constant source of inspiration to so many people. So my job now is to rapidly go through what's been in the news and, and our national survey highlights from you, our audience, last month. For those that are new to our, our webinars, we are conducting survey research uh, during every webinar. We'd like for you to be able to answer the questions at the end of the webinar, and it is the compass that guides us to the topics of critical importance. So before we get into this issue of drug diversion, sepsis has been a critically important area and we continue to have uh, enormous response. We've done a three-part series and we ask you, after the third part of a three-part series, would you like more on sepsis? And we had this overwhelming response of 94% agreeing and 65% giving them a 10. And we have had uh, just staggering numbers of uh, attendees on our webinars. And so this tells us you want a part four and more practical work on sepsis. We also ask free text entry questions, which I won't read the answers to or the topics on slide 14, but go back to slide 14. We will use this to help define part four. We will invite Dr. Huddleston from the Mayo Clinic, our wonderful performance improvement partner, uh, to help chair that. And we will invite the other speakers that we've had to, co to comment, but we'll dig into the very specific areas that you've told us about on slide four and slide five. Slide five, the text is just a little larger. We had so much uh, uh, input, and we really appreciate, again, these survey questions because it guides our focus. Uh, however, I won't read them. Enough to say, absolutely, we'll tackle it. Now, another area that Dr. Jean Huddleston addressed from the Mayo Clinic in terms of mortality reviews was triage and emergency department. And guiding patients to triage, they found that they dramatically reduced uh, the harm to patients and what they call at Mayo Clinic the opportunities for improvement, found a terrific number in triage uh, and getting patients to the right place at the right time in emergencies. And uh, although you had 74% of you agreed, 36% gave it a 10. So we will cover that as one of our topics in the future webinars in addition to sepsis. Again, free text entry questions on page 17 were the topics that, that you said you wanted us to cover and they'll guide us. And I just want to remind those that are the first timers with us on drug diversion, we're going to ask the questions of you. Keep note of what uh, what uh, Kim uh, uh, New tells us and teaches us and what Chief Adcox and what uh, Dr. Boats uh, address uh, so that you can give us free text uh, uh, answers to what you'd like if you like if you want more on drug diversion. Now next month we're going to cover EHR related safety issues and uh, have Dr. Koppel come back from uh, from uh, Wharton to address them. And we ask, do you want an update on EHR safety issues? We had a pretty compellingly strong response, not as much as sepsis, but it's enough to say, yes, we'll come back to you with EHR. So next month will be EHR patient safety and cybercrime issues. Your free text entry answers on page 19. Number of areas, you can see sepsis pops up even in that. Um, and the copy and paste issues and a number of issues that pertain to uh, uh, the EHR. So with that, 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 that's the summary. We're eight minutes after the hour, so we're right on time. I just wanted to give you the follow-up to let you know that we will definitely be doing EHR and sepsis in the next two months. Um, I want to give you a quick update now on slide 20 on the MedTAC program. The MedTAC program actually evolved from the two gentlemen that are going to be our reactors today, Chief Adcox and Dr. Boats, uh, in our work together at MD Anderson and Texas Medical Center when we um, identified the leading causes of death of children, young adults, and those in their workforce years. These are otherwise healthy people. What, cause, what are the preventable causes of death that we can address with bystander care? Cardiac arrest, choking and drowning, opioid overdose, which we're covering today, and poisoning lumped in together with that, anaphylaxis, major trauma with major bleeding being part of major trauma, common accidents, transportation accidents that are not traffic accidents. These are drive-over accidents that occur in school grounds and near homes that are unrelated to, to, air, to cars crashing. And then bullying and workplace violence. Quick update there, we've now graduated three classes uh, uh, in California and Orange County. Uh, one of the new innovations that was really inspired by Dr. Boats is on the call. Uh, two innovations that you'll see have now uh, are now being piloted in California and will soon to be piloted in Texas. 
uh, and we have a number of students that are now involved from uh, USC Film School, Stanford University, University of Texas, the University of Indiana, University of Florida, uh, a number of high school students from Houston, from Maui, Hawaii, and others are now working on this MedTAC program. And basically what it is is training people uh, that might be 10 years of age and older on the interventions for sudden cardiac arrest, choking, opioid overdose, anaphylaxis, and we all know uh, CPR, AEDs, uh, Heimlich maneuver, Narcan, uh, EpiPens for anaphylaxis, Stop the Bleed program for major trauma, and on and on. And we've got a little more lengthy detail that we've covered previously, but we would just wanted to remind those that haven't seen this, this is to focus on the first 10 minutes uh, before the professional first responders arrive, or what we would call bystander or immediate care. And now with Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma, we know that those times are extended, and so this was the focus. You see this backpack uh, uh, that was actually the inspiration of Dr. Boats uh, that provides all the materials that you need and the checklist that you see through the window Behind the window on that backpack is an AED, and this backpack contains what you'd need to be able to implement bystander care. This is non-clinically trained people for these problems. Uh, and I'd like to have Greg. Greg, do you want to take it from here and give us a quick 30-second or a minute on, on, on the, the, the care pack concept? Sure, Chuck, I'd be glad to. Um, as many of you know, we've been speaking about the uh, MedTech program for some time. And it's really a, a program to enable people to be uh, bystander responders before our professional first responders arrive. And we've designed it to uh, allow people to change behaviors that become lifeline behaviors uh, that can save lives. And the idea behind this uh, care pack is to have the right tools available for those bystander responders to do uh, the life-saving things that they need to do. So having an AED available for sudden cardiac arrest or having uh, stop the bleed uh, materials if there is uh, uh, an event that, that has massive bleeding as one of the uh, consequences. And so the idea is to build a, a reasonable uh, pack that has just enough uh, materials to do those things um, that can be portable and available for uh, med tech trained personnel to use um, in in such events, uh, especially in being prepared for uh, for events that have a, an increased risk for those uh, events to take place, like um, high school or college sporting events or places where people gather for um, social events where the likelihood that someone might have uh, one of those problems might arise. And so we're excited to see that we're building this pack that's uh, been well received by the audience and is going to be deployed uh, with the MedTech program as we move forward. So uh, in the news, uh, just in the last week, and one of the areas that MedTech is focused on is, is allergies and anaphylaxis. Excellent article in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday, and we put it up for you. It's got a great review, frequency, what we need to be uh, looking at, what we need to be targeting, and uh, uh, so we just want to remind you of that. So now as a setup for uh, our lead speaker today, I'd like to just address a few slides that we've had in prior slides regarding opioid overdose and just remind you all this, this crisis that's occurring with fentanyl and carfentanil and show the relative difference in the volume of the, and potency and equivalent potency of heroin versus fentanyl and carfentanil uh, with fentanyl being many times more potent than heroin and carfentanil even many times uh, more powerful than, uh, th than that. Um, the slide number 26 is one that I'd really recommend you go and, and look at the article in the New York Times of January 7th last year. It has the, the, um, the, 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 the epidemic of drug overdose deaths. And so this slide you'll see here in the deck. And now what I'm going to do is use an animation to advance uh, uh, this slide uh, and show you how rapidly, year by year, the growth of, uh, of opioid overdoses uh, have occurred in certain states. This is, the, th this is where our biggest problems are growing uh, as, they, uh, as they go through. So the first slide is the article from the New York Times we'd recommend, and the second is the animation. 
Now, in this MedTech program that we're working on, we are, we are developing courses for doctors, nurses, anesthesiologists, primary care doctors, medical students, pharmacy students, nursing students, and that will be a two-day, 16-hour course. That's on one end of the continuum. On the other end, we're doing schools, churches, membership organizations like Scouts, and then in the middle between those two, uh, we're working with the law enforcement officers and security with, uh, do with uh, Chief Adcox and, and Dr. Boats in the lead on content here. These are the estimated preventable deaths in the two pilot areas where we're working on MedTech right now, uh, and, and that could be live, lives that could be saved with naloxone and bystander care. So in Orange County, where I am today, uh, 413 uh, in this year, and this is using the New York Times estimate you'll see here in a moment, with all of Texas and all of California, look at the numbers over on the far right, and then we have the numbers uh, uh, across the board for the U U.S. And because MD Anderson is in Houston, if you look at Houston, um, uh, an enormous number, uh, you know, uh, as well. So as we go to uh, now to set up for uh, for Kim New, uh, one of the what, just a great video and a great article in USA Today in 2014 uh, has two caregivers uh, telling their stories, and then Kim is actually one of the spokes people in this video. It's about six or seven minutes. And so if you look at the source, uh, it's a great video to show to your staff because you have a physician who's back uh, practicing medicine and a nurse, and a nurse actually from Houston, uh, and they both describe how they were impaired and how much they were actually taking. And uh, it, it really drives home from two very authentic and, and caregivers that we could relate to. Great article, great video, and and Kim is one of the speakers in that article. Now, this New York Times article that just came out uh, 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 last year and the estimates that we've added to it that have just come out from the New York Times uh, is just is staggering. If you look at the curves of the number of, uh, of deaths per year and how, for, how it, this is just an exploding problem with opioids and with fentanyl and, uh, and uh, carfentanil, it's amazing. So this article just came out uh, since we had our last webinar. Uh, deaths of roughly six, 64,000 people in the U.S. last year with a 22% growth over the prior year. This is the latest data estimated by New York Times. Now, New York Times is not the New England Journal of Medicine, but I think we're seeing that this across the board. Uh, this was a drug bust that, uh, that just happened day before yesterday that was in the news. 195 pounds of fentanyl. Um, one sting netted 32 million lethal doses, just one sting. So 10% of our American population could be killed by just one, uh, one drug bust. So we, this is just an exploding problem, and the articles are not even keeping up with them. Um, we've shown this article before. This is August 15th, the fentanyl uh, link to the thousand of urban overdose deaths. So for those of you that have not uh, seen our prior videos to set up this issue with, uh, with uh, opioid overdose, we wanted you to see it. Now, uh, and our, a, a great book that uh, Chief Adcox actually sent to me is Pandora's Lab, Seven Stories of Science Gone Wrong. And it had a great history of this opioid crisis, a very fast read. It's the first chapter. And it really described where the slang has come from, the word smack, junkies, hopheads, going cold turkey, kicking the habit. Uh, these all actually have uh, uh, these slang terms have, have, have been uh, anchored in our history. And again, so that we can move to, uh, to Kim, I won't describe all of them, but I found this pretty insightful uh, on terms that we use every day uh, and uh, about this uh, issue. Uh, this is a quick summary of this book, which I recommend. It's an interesting and provocative book. The first cha chapter is God's Own Medicine, which was uh, 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 was uh, coined as the the name uh, a name for uh, opium. And over the years, the amazing uh, focus that we've had where people have said, I have a new breakthrough, it's called morphine, or I have a new breakthrough, it's OxyContin, or I have a new break breakthrough, where addiction has been decoupled from the pain relief, and they've been based on minimal data. So the contention of the book is nobody's looked at the data 
to see that there wasn't enough data to support that they were not addictive. And that caused the FDA to change uh, a number of, uh, uh, the, the, in fact, the labels with these drugs. A second book I recommend is, that is Dreamland, and it also describes the history and kind of how we got there. Again, I won't belabor it. This is kind of part of the in the news. But this timeline was so, was so uh, you know, amazing. This timeline is articulated in the first chapter of Pandora's Lab, uh, back from Hi Hippocrates to uh, when the bitter, the bitter gall uh, fluid was provided to Christ on the cross and he denied it because it had a pain reliever in it and it's hypothesized it was opium laudanum where, uh, where brandy was mixed with it and it was the sophisticated addiction of ladies in high socioeconomic status. The concept of morphium coming from Morphe Morphe Morpheus, the Greek god, and on and on, the opium wars with China, and then how opium was brought to San Francisco, and how, in fact, one quarter of the, the Chinese population became addicted that led to that. And then now in this century, uh, where our country has recognized this issue, but even in the public, uh, out, out in, in, in media, the Wizard of Oz has a reference to the poppy field and, and impairment. And then as we pr progress from 1984 to today with this explosion of, of overdoses, this uh, probably one of the most, the most noteworthy things is that gunshot wounds and auto accidents uh, uh, exceeded, uh, were exceeded by op uh, opioid overdose. So this is kind of a setup to, uh, to Kim, and it was very instructive to us as we were building the opiate, uh, the opiate module for an opioid overdose module for MedTech. So um, now setting up with uh, setting up uh, uh, Kim, uh, uh, these are two articles that she shared with us that you may download from our website. The first is Detecting and Responding to Drug Diversion, an excellent article uh, by, by her. The second article is Effective Diversion Program in 10 Steps. Uh, these, are, these are excellent. And uh, I know she'll cover some of these topics as we go through, uh, as, as uh, she goes through her talk. I just want to remind you that, you know, there is the, the, the high road to the shining city on the hill. Proper care of pain, which Dr. Uh, which Dr. Gladstone McDowell presented with the five rights of pain management, are what we're all trying to do. And we want to remind you to go back to Dr. McDowell's presentation on pain management, the five rights of pain care. However, when diversion occurs, that's when we have these problems. And so what I'd like to do now is just uh, introduce uh, Kim, who is a very, very knowledgeable uh, uh, person on this topic. She's a specialist in controlled substance security and DEA regulatory compliance. She consults with healthcare facilities across the country. I think you'll find her writing to be excellent. She's made a career of assisting facilities starting and refining their drug diversion programs with the goal of protecting patients from the harm that's frequently associated with diversion. She's a nurse and an attorney. She's the co-founder of the exec and executive director of the International Health Facility Diversion Association, and she's a member of the executive board for a partnership for safe medicines. And we've just found her to be an excellent source of information and is, is I, I think, here to give us some really pra great practical insight. So welcome, Kim. Thanks so much for speaking uh, with us today. And I think we're right on time. You've got plenty of time. Thanks, Chuck, and thank you all for inviting me to be a part of this um, important work that you're doing. This is certainly very um, important information that I'll be sharing today. So we're turning um, the page a bit. We're looking at drug diversion by healthcare personnel. Um, and I, I put down a part of the opioid epidemic that we avoid discussing because even though this is gaining more and more recognition, it is still a topic that isn't often discussed within many facilities across the U.S. Um, so a simple definition is stealing medication, including waste, from patients or healthcare facilities for personal or unauthorized use. Who gets involved in this type of activity? Well, there are a number of folks that we see across an institution. We focus a lot on nurses because nurses are the number one patient care population with regular access to controlled drugs. Nurses are caught more often as a result of their access, but that doesn't mean that other folks don't get involved, and certainly we do see a lot of other people involved in diversion within a healthcare facility. Um, other types of staff, whether they have legitimate access or not, um, anesthesia providers, pharmacy providers, technicians, and others, 
Um, we see contractors even get involved in this type of activity. One facility I work with had an OR renovation going on, and um, there was a contractor who was there Monday through Friday, month after month, and he began to notice that some of the anesthesia providers would leave syringes out when they would take the patient to the recovery room, and it didn't take long for him to realize that he could slip in undetected and was able to find syringes that were labeled with fentanyl on them, and he did um, divert those. We see patients get involved in diversion even when they are patients within the facility. Um, one facility I work with had a um, patient in the ER. The physician knocked on the door, went to go in and, and examine her, and when he opened up the door, her arm was wedged in a sharps container and she couldn't get it out. Um, we see visitors get involved in this type of activity and family members. Um, at another institution, there was recently a woman in intensive care who was on a PCA, a fentanyl PCA, and her son came to visit her and um, was acting a bit strange. The nurses were a little bit on alert because he didn't seem, seems like something was wrong, but they couldn't really put their finger on anything specific. At 3 a.m., his nurse went in to draw um, blood from his, from her nurse went in to draw blood from the central line. And when she went in, she noticed that there was blood backing down the central line. When she looked a bit further, she saw that there was actually a clean cut in the, in the line um, and a scissors on the floor, and she looked over in the chair. The son was, was just fully abtunded in the chair, having diverted fentanyl out of her PCA. And then even imposters, particularly in academic institutions, large academic institutions, imposters can come in, pose as a, um, as a student or a physician, and actually um, engage in diversion. Is this really a risk? Absolutely. All facilities are vulnerable. And um, this is not something that reflects the quality of the institution. In fact, I would, as a patient, much rather be at an institution that is finding diversion than one that says they don't have a problem. Um, it's important that we treat this the same as we do other patient safety initiatives because there are so many um, victims that are involved, but certainly patients front and center can be harmed um, and, and even killed as a result of a diversion scheme. So this is my first question of you all. Um, how often does it happen? An average 500-bed hospital will have about how many drug diversion cases each year? Zero to one, two to 10, 10 to 20, or over 20? And the result may be surprising, over 20. I actually came from a 550-bed hospital before I became a consultant, and when we initially started our diversion program, we were catching three to four per month. Um, that did level out eventually, but and, and certainly I want to make a point here. There is no quota. Um, there certainly isn't a specific number that we would expect, but we would expect any facility that has controlled substances being stored and used um, to be finding some diversion um, on a fairly regular basis. Why in healthcare? Well, we're part of that general population um, that is involved in the opioid ep epidemic, and we don't have a special dispensation that, a, that will protect us from that. Um, in addition, we do have a stressful work environment many times, and we have seen an increasing number of veterans that are coming back from combat um, who are self-medicating uh, for PTSD, for physical injuries, and we, um, we also see a lot of other folks who are just self-medicating either for um, psychological issues and stress or for, the, for injuries that they have had. Also, a large number of folks who are coming back from um, medical leave who have had a prescription. In fact, on the, um, the, one of the previous slides that Chuck referred to, there was the USA Today article, and um, Dr. Lloyd, who is a friend of mine, who is a physician in recovery, um, began down the road of diversion after he had been given a prescription for an opioid in conjunction with a procedure. So many times we see individuals who just simply aren't able to stop once the prescription runs out. Knowledge and familiarity certainly plays a big role in that, and I think um, that Dr. Boats would certainly agree with that. We see that very commonly in anesthesia providers who feel that they really understand the drug. Um, they're familiar with it. They can control the situation. And we see it also in nurses. Um, you know, if I decide to self-medicate, I'm going to be fine. I can, I'm in control of this. But the reality is it's a very, very slippery slope. And then the big one, of course, is access. So who gets involved in this type of activity? Um, one of the things that we find commonly is that 
when we're talking with staff and leadership within institutions, they're looking for some of the, um, I'll call them stereotypical um, signs of addiction or drug abuse. And that really couldn't, it couldn't be further from, from what we actually oftentimes see. So here on a slide, you see a number of folks. Some of them have been involved in diversion, some have not. And as you see, these are lovely people. Um, people where it would be very difficult to pick out who did it and who didn't do it. Um, here you see the folks that, that I know for a fact have not been involved in it because that's my son, my husband, and uh, my son's best friend um, who posted their pictures on Facebook, so I stole them. But the others have been involved, and the point here is not to say that these are bad people or look at what they've done, but more to say it's the last person you would ever expect. These are not individuals who fit commonly held stereotypes of individuals who are stealing and abusing drugs. So another question for you all, what, what did the following actually happened? A physician who found himself short on funds while gambling in Las Vegas um, sold prescriptions to other gamblers to make money to keep gambling. An environmental services worker cracked a diversion case at a hospital when she found prints on the toilet seat in the staff bathroom or a nurse manager who was fired for stealing from, sharp, from pharmaceutical sharps containers, visited hospitals in her city disguised as an employee of the container company to continue her diversion scheme? And the answer is all of the above. Um, many times I'm asked about the environmental services worker, and in that particular case, there was um, a nurse on the floor who was diverting, and he decided that as part of his scheme, it would make more sense for him to store all of his supplies, like saline flush, tourniquet, needles, syringes, in the ceiling tiles um, than to be carrying those in and out of the bathroom because he was using in the staff bathroom, which we, we know is quite common. And so he stored everything up there. The nurse or the environmental services worker went in, looked at the toilet seat, saw the footprints, looked up and saw the ceiling tile slightly ajar and notified someone. The potential for harm in patients is certainly very substantial. Um, patients can be harmed by care delivered by an impaired provider. Um, and it's not just impairment that I'm concerned about when I see these cases because um, in my experience in speaking with people who have been involved in diversion, they are often working in a very distracted state. So I have um, found just almost universally that an individual who is a healthcare provider who is diverting drugs will, be, uh, will almost always be working under the influence of those drugs. In addition, they're worried about whether they have enough medication to get through till the next shift, whether somebody saw them do something, and so they're distracted and they are working under the influence of these very powerful opioids and, and benzodiazepines. Um, withholding medications from patients in need, and that's very egregious, that I don't think is, an, is a first method for anyone who um, is a caring provider. But over time, there simply isn't enough to go around. And so we have seen this time and time again. If a diversion scheme continues unchecked, the individual will at some point um, no longer be willing to share with patients and will keep all of the medication and leave patients to linger in pain. And then we see transmission of bloodborne pathogens. And that is through the most egregious type of diversion called pampering and substitution. Um, it typically involves an injectable, but not always. And we'll be talking about this a little bit more later. But um, just to give you an idea of what I'm, what I'm talking about, if an injectable is involved, what, it, what it commonly happens is that the diverter will inject themselves with um, contents from a drip, from a syringe, from a vial, and then they will replace that volume with the same needle and syringe um, and use the saline or tap water or some other substance to replace the um, volume. In these cases, patients are always harmed, and there is always a strong likelihood that, that patients can, be, um, can end up with, a, with a, being exposed to a bloodborne pathogen as a result of these, um, these issues. We also see overdose and death in staff members. And unfortunately, this happens more commonly than many people think. Um, there have been a number of cases in facilities that I work with. In fact, I'm hard pressed to think of a facility that I work with that hasn't had that happen. Um, driving impaired. So there is even a risk to the community, folks that aren't patients within a facility. What you see here in this picture is the remains of a bicycle. There was a, a lovely nurse who had a history of diversion 
Um, she was driving home one evening under the influence of medication that she had stolen, and there was a cyclist on the road, a uh, father of two little boys who was in his early 40s. She hit him, and this is what's left of his bike. Um, the impact transected his spine. We've seen many cases across the country, and um, I'm sure that Chief Adcox could probably attest to this, um, in which healthcare personnel have diverted our driving under the influence home from work and um, cause accidents that cause harm to themselves and others. The risk to the institution uh, certainly demoralized workforce. When these, when these cases happen, anyone who is listening who's had one can attest to this, um, staff become very demoralized. They feel very um, angry. They go through the phases of grief and, um, and just really struggle um, to recover when they've had a colleague who's been involved in this. Negative publicity can be ongoing. Um, I work with some facilities who have had big cases that were nationally publicized. And in many cases, even when the, the, the case ostensibly has, has been wrapped up, it will resurface in the media, um, you know, periodically. So it may be years before it actually ever um, kind of goes away. And then we see regulatory scrutiny, certainly from a number of different entities and civil and regulatory liability. There have been a number of um, large DEA fines that have been, um, that have been, uh, uh, publicized more recently, one on the West Coast for 1.5 million, one on the East Coast for 2.3 million, and then we've seen a number of different um, fines, and really I should say DOJ imposed fines um, for these types of cases. Other risks, uh, many times when people are involved in diversion, they are they are perusing your medical record looking for a patient profile to divert under. They want to find a patient who has the right drugs ordered and um, find an opportunity to steal medication under that, that individual's profile, and that is snooping for personal gain. Not really any different from a unit secretary who finds patient IDs and information and sells them for monetary gain. Um, so these are very serious crimes and can result in um, prison terms for the individuals involved, monetary fines for the individuals and the facilities as well. How do they get away with it? Well, here's a few pictures um, just from my experience on site at facilities. I know propofol is not a controlled substance um, federally, and it certainly um, isn't in most states. It is in some. But as you can see in the picture on the left, there's a massive quantity of propofol there, and we have seen case after case in which um, staff members gain access to propofol and actually abuse it. One of um, my work colleagues and friends is an anesthesia, anesthesia provider in recovery, and he, um, he used propofol regularly when he um, was also using fentanyl. Here you see a syringe of fentanyl. This was left on a counter in a OR, and there was a nurse in the room. She was a circulator. They were just leaving. Um, they were. It was between cases, and she, um, I was introduced as a diversion um, auditor when I walked into the room, and she pointed to the syringe, and she goes, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of how we leave our drugs, um, and then kind of laughed and really didn't see an issue with it and was willing to walk out and leave me in there with that fentanyl syringe. Here you see also an anesthesia cart with a kit um, containing vast quantities of opioids, benzodiazepines, and other medications. Uh, many times we find across the um, country that these types of carts have very predictable codes. Um, I have about a 95% pass rate to be able to get into them on the first try. Uh, my business partner does much better. He has about a 98% um, chance of gaining access on his first attempt. Uh, and then you see these syringes that were actually in a um, sharps container in an OR pharmacy. And then just uh, one other slide, just to give you some idea of what we're seeing across the country. You see here a number of items, um, including PCAs, fentanyl vials, and a hydromorphone um, vial. These were all pulled out of a sharps container in a facility um, that assured me in this particular instance that they had some problems. They were first to, to admit that, um, and we all do, of course. Um, but they said, well, one thing I think we're doing well is that you will not find intact medications in our sharps containers, but unfortunately, um, we did. 
So the longer an individual is involved in this type of activity, the more severe the consequences become. So we want to catch these cases early. We want to get these folks um, out of contact with patients and get them the help they need. Over 50% of the diverters in our experience are starting with injectables. Um, some have tracks, and many are very clever, and they're able to conceal um, injection sites. The drugs of choice that we're seeing diverted right now include hydromorphone and morphine. Um, these are in general clinical areas. Fentanyl and propofol are added to the mix in um, critical care areas, ER, uh, procedural areas, and OR. We also see hydrocodone and oxycodone, um, of course, and fentanyl patches. Fentanyl patches have a lot of uh, fentanyl left in them after they've been on the body for three days. We've seen instances in which staff pull them off and, and suck on them, um, carry around old patches and put those on patients and keep the new patches. Um, so there's certainly something to be um, aware of as, as well when you're considering your diversion program. Most individuals in our experience who are diverting uh, have an opioid of choice. Some will gravitate towards a benzodiazepine or some will have a, a, a small group of, of medications of choice, but in our experience, oftentimes and most often, it is an opioid of choice. When a, a, a diverter is a direct care provider, like an anesthesiologist or a nurse, we see more commonly that they are um, diverting for personal use. They're very secretive about it. Um, they're not selling on the street. In the pharmacy, we see that same types of that same type of behavior, but we also do see um, probably an increased propensity to be selling because if you have a good scheme of diversion in the pharmacy, you can make a lot of money. Other drugs of choice, oftentimes we will see that someone who has an opioid of choice that they're diverting will eventually start diverting some of these other medications like benzodiazepines to cope with the um, symptoms of opioid abuse and withdrawal. We see um, drugs used to ease withdrawal or enhance the impact of the opioid. Diversion of ondansetron is extremely common in drug diversion cases. I, I do surveillance for a large academic medical center on the West Coast, and that means looking at their drug transactions and um, analytics reports. I don't look at ondansetron as a primary drug that I'm doing surveillance on, but if I'm on the fence about something and I'm not really sure what's going on, I oftentimes will look at some of these other drugs and how the individual is handling these because it can give me more information and sometimes actually shed light on what actually is a diversion scheme. We see promethazine and diphenhydramine in injectable forms, um, oftentimes used as a substitute. Those are given to the patient and the opioid is kept for the diverter. Other drugs, uh, cyclobenzaprine, catorlac, gabapentin, acetaminophen is commonly diverted in conjunction with an oral opioid. What we will see is a, is a removal of both at the same time. The acetaminophen is given to the patient. The opioid is kept for the diverter. We also have seen in the past year an increase in the diversion of naloxone. We've seen a number of individuals who um, are diverting very powerful opioids and have started to divert, to, to divert naloxone just in case. And then we see um, anesthesia gases. A big one is um, nitrous oxide that is diverted by staff um, in facilities that have, um, that administer it in laboring patients, but also in children's hospitals. Propofol abuse is a well-known um, phenomenon and it does increase dopamine activity in the brain and um, is used. I've heard diverters tell me that they use it um, many times as a um, sleep aid, although of course, the um, benefit would be rather dubious. So um, cases of tampering are definitely increasing. We are seeing a lot of tampering and substitution, and that really has me worried. Um, just to give you an idea, my business um, colleague and I were on site at a facility just doing a simple medical record audit. Um, we were there doing a risk assessment. We Part of that is looking at their transactions. So we were looking, and we saw some very concerning transactions. Um, asked someone in the pharmacy if they could take us up to the drug cabinet, and lo and behold, when we opened up the drawer, we found tampered with morphine carpajax. There is a potential for very widespread patient harm in these cases, um, and even lawsuits by patients at facilities um, that are downstream from where these cases occur. Most institutions, in our experience, aren't fully prepared to address this. 
These are some of the more recent cases that we've seen in published in the media. Um, McKay D. Davis Hospital in that particular case, I believe the nurse infected approximately seven people so far with hepatitis C. We saw a case um, that was on the West Coast and then progressed um, and ended up being detected in Colorado. In that case, it was a surgical technician. He did not have legitimate access to controlled medications, but in the operative and procedural areas, um, he found that nurses and physicians had left fentanyl syringes unattended, and he was able to inject himself with the contents, fill them back up with saline, and put them back for use on patients. Um, in that case, uh, patients were notified they needed to be, um, they needed bloodborne pathogen testing, um, that there was potential exposure. It was ultimately determined in that case that the um, diverter was HIV infected. No patients have um, come up positive for HIV. And then there's a case, the last one was a case um, there in Shore Medical Center um, that was actually a pharmacist that was involved in tampering and substitution. Here you see tampered with morphine carpajex. Um, it may be a little hard for you to see, but if you look closely on the left, the syringe has the tamper evidence seal sliced. The one on the right is intact. And this is what we were finding at this particular facility that I was referring to. On that particular instance, the nurses were working in a very busy um, unit, patients that were um, a population of patients that would have a lot of pain, and they were grabbing these and not really even noticing that the um, tamper evidence seal was not intact. Here you see tampered with um, vials from an old case. On the left, you can see the superglue residue. This is very common. Um, individuals actually superglue the caps back on after they have tampered with them. Um, and many times I, when I'm educating staff about tampering, they'll say, well, who's going to carry um, superglue to the Pixis or the OmniCell or the AccuDose machine um, and, and stand there and do that? Well, no one is, really, um, I would hope. But what they do oftentimes is that they take home used vials, carpajex, syringes, and, and reconstruct them at home. Then they come back to the facility and all it takes is a, is one transaction. All you have to do is gain access to that hydromorphone pocket in the drug cabinet. And once you do that, you can take out all of the good, all of the good stock and replace it with the ones you have tampered with. In this particular case, there are two other um, vials you see there and the levels in those two vials is too low. Here you see some tampered with hydromorphone um, PCAs. You can't really um, tell them too well, but um, what was found is that these round caps that I have a circle on there on the left were off and um, the, there was substantial volume missing. Um, this is another um, happen upon situation. One facility that we work with just happened to start, while we, while we were on site, happened to start seeing um, fentanyl vials that were in the, the secure pocket in the drug cabinet, but had the caps missing. Double plungers are another common, uh, more common method recently. Um, it, it certainly isn't something I've been exposed to in the past, but we're seeing it at a, at a couple of hospitals at least. In these particular cases, these are um, PCAs, and um, as we are able to reconstruct the scheme, um, the, the little um, actual plastic push um, device is not actually part of the, the PCA. So those are obtained separately in a little kit. And what we're seeing is that someone is oftentimes expelling a large amount of the fentanyl PCA, and that will result in the plunger going about halfway or three quarters of the way down. They will then um, take another plunger and, and put it right at the top. And um, PCA pumps oftentimes will read that they actually have volume, and so they'll the, the pump will operate ostensibly for a bit, but it's not really delivering anything, and then it will register occlusion. What we're finding in these types of cases is that nursing staff most often attribute these issues to a manufacturing defect. It's very hard for them to believe that anybody would actually do something like this intentionally. And so oftentimes very valuable evidence is wasted. You see here on the left another PCA the little top, at the white cap at the top, once that's popped off, um, it's, it's off for good. And this was actually a PCA we found that didn't have any volume in it from the plunger up. The other one, someone has actually pried or burned the top off um, to gain access. 
So it is important to put tampering on your radar, and I'm just mentioning it because of the um, the number of incidents we're seeing across the country. I think it's something that really um, every facility should be focusing on. And, and Chuck, I will get you a set of um, sample education slides. They're very brief. It's just a small slide set that you can use, or that your um, that that members can use to um, educate within their facility. They're they're great for huddles, um, and I'd be happy to to send those to you. But um, as I that mentioned, would be, that would be great, and also videos that you think will be helpful. People are increasingly wanting to learn that way. Great, I'd be happy to do it. Um, so staff do need education because they, they really honestly have no idea what's happening and I can't tell you how many times they have wasted um, valuable evidence. It's just it's just really the reflex. It's the norm. Um, so we want them to be on the alert, but we don't want them to be afraid. And so I hope my slides will be helpful in that regard. Um, <clears throat> every facility also needs to have a policy and a plan to respond to this because these cases are a crisis. Um, this is every everybody, all hands on deck. Um, we have to maintain the chain of custody of the evidence. Um, we have to know where we're going to be sending the evidence for analysis if we have to end up doing that to see if it's actually been tampered with. I recommend uh, uh, contacting the FDA Office of Criminal Investigations. In my experience, they are very, very helpful. They are, they are facility friendly, um, and they have their own Can forensic lab. Where they can you yes. state the name? <clears throat> it's the FDA Office of Criminal Investigations, and that's FDA OCI. Great. Thank you. That's um, great. Yeah, absolutely. So they oftentimes really can help um, a facility with, with just maintaining the chain of custody and the analysis, which can be quite expensive and um, and uh, technically a little bit tricky. Um, so they're, they're a great resource. And then we have to do an internal risk assessment as well. But remember, anytime there is potentially tampered with product, um, not only do we have to secure what we see that looks obviously tampered with, but we also have to examine the rest of the product within that cabinet. Um, we have to look even further. It may have, been, may have happened in the pharmacy. So it really requires um, all hands on deck to try to figure out what happened, um, how can we protect patients from further harm as we're assessing really the scope of the problem. So with diversion, how do you develop, how do you protect your, your patients and your staff? Because this of course is a staff safety issue as well. Well, one of the things is to develop a formal program. This is becoming much more mainstream, uh, but there are still a number of facilities that don't really have a formal process. And what happens if you don't have a, have a described formal um, program in place is that you tend to be in reactive mode. So you react to cases as if they are isolated events um, and you're always really one step behind and it puts everyone at risk. We also want folks to increase transparency within the organization and discuss this topic frequently. Um, I know many facilities that I work with do not want to discuss cases of diversion with their staff. The last thing they want is for, for word to get out in the community or, or an article to, to surface, you know, about their facility having a problem. The reality is all facilities have this, and so we have to approach it um, in that fashion. And if we aren't transparent with staff about the topic, if we don't let them know that we have cases within our facility, they will never believe that, that, that they are really at risk. They won't believe that it happens there, and um, consequently, they will be much less inclined to comply with um, security measures and other things that you would expect for them to do to help prevent and detect diversion quickly. Um, ensure that all of the efforts that you are doing are documented. One thing that we find commonly across the country is that um, facilities will have at least some degree of surveillance or auditing going on. Maybe it's pharmacy staff that are looking at transactions or um, analytics reports such as RX Auditor or, or um, Pandora, some of those that are out there. Um, and sometimes it's nursing leadership and sometimes it's a joint um, effort, nursing and uh, pharmacy are looking at these reports. But what commonly happens is that no one is really has a, has a good way of documenting what they're doing. And so when a regulatory entity comes in, 
Um, you may ask a nurse on 2 East, a, a manager there, who says, well, sure, I was doing the reviews, but I just kept mental notes. You may have a nurse on 3 East who says, um, well, I have this fancy spreadsheet and I put everything there. You may t talk to a nurse in the ER who says, um, I just make notes on a paper copy and if everything's good, I toss it. So um, we want to make sure that we have a good way of, of documenting everything we're doing. And don't forget education. That's key. In my experience, when DEA and other regulatory entities come in in diversion cases, one of the big questions is, how have you educated your staff? So you want to make sure you get credit for everything you're doing. If you are doing some type of education about drug diversion and substance use disorder and some of the other things that are, are part of this equation, it's important to make sure you've got those well documented. Ensure that you have appropriate resources allocated. That is sometimes problematic, there's no question. Um, and it's hard to demonstrate um, uh, on the front end, the value of having a full-time person looking at diversion within your facility. But in reality, it's it's something that will save facilities a tremendous amount of money, um, negative publicity, and risk. And so I strongly recommend that you have someone who is designated to be in charge of the operations of the program. And we'll discuss that a little bit more in a minute. And then just remember, when you're looking at all of these, the risks really are very substantial. This is not something that will ever go away, so we really have to address it head on. What does that formal program look like? I strongly recommend that you have an oversight committee, and this is high-level leadership. Um, it oftentimes includes some uh, chief of anesthesia or his or her designee, um, your chief medical officer, um, someone from your C-suite, your chief nursing officer or designee, um, people who are able to get things done, people who have the authority and um, who are, are engaged in what, you, what is the risk to the institution. So I think that's, that's a good way to start is to get that committee into place to start looking at what is our risk and where, where can we go from here uh, to reduce that risk. There are a number of tools across the, um, the country that are available to help you assess your own risk. Um, ASHP has uh, published a set of, of guidelines that you can use. Um, there is a, um, a, a set of guidelines and a gap analysis, if you will, that came out of the Mayo Clinic and some of the fabulous work they're doing. And then there are public health departments or departments of health across the country and hospital associations who have developed standards that can help facilities assess their own situation. There should also be a response team. One of the, one of the things that many facilities that I work with struggle with um, when they start their program is they, they kind of ramp up their, their investigations and they're, now all of a sudden they're, they're really looking, you know, closely at some of the records and they're starting to find staff that are involved in diversion and then they realize, uh oh, we don't have <laughs> we don't have a plan to deal with it when we find it. Um, diversion is different than a typical um, case in which a, an employee is showing overt signs of impairment. Uh, we know how to handle those. We we go with HR, we deal with those through the normal HR types of processes. But diversion can the suspicion of diversion can arise from data. It can arise from the reports that come from the drug cabinets and the analytics reports, and it oftentimes actually does. In fact, I would tell you that I would hope that that's where you're finding most of your diversion because we can see signs of diversion in those reports much sooner than we will see outward signs of impairment or um, suspicious behaviors. In fact, Signs of impairment and suspicious behaviors in a diverter are late signs. So we really want to use data. But the issue here is that your facility may not have, and, and many probably won't have, um, in their policies associated with reasonable suspicion, will not have language that addresses a source being strictly data. So we need to look at that and, and how will we handle that. Um, anytime you're just using data, people become very uncomfortable, and there's no question I understand that. Um, I, I, I totally understand that. Um, and that's why I do recommend that you have a response team. This is typically a small multidisciplinary team that will review data that, that, um, that rises to the, the level of reasonable suspicion. This team will look at that 
and make their own determination about whether reasonable suspicion really exists and that the employee should then be brought in or whether we should just wait and monitor. We may not have enough yet and we're not convinced. Um, so this team can be a really good safety net. Um, it can help um, other staff feel more comfortable reporting because they know that this is not something that is a decision that's made by just one person. It's, it's a thoughtful multidisciplinary team. I mentioned having a person in charge of the operations, and that is typically the diversion specialist or the controlled substance program manager, whatever term you want to use. Um, I do work with critical access hospitals that don't have the ability, clearly, to have a full-time person in this role, um, and, I, and I understand that. In those instances, I still think they need someone who has, as part of their role, um, being in charge of the operations of the program, because if you think about it, there's a lot to do. Um, these individuals need to make sure that the policies within the facility are up to date. They need to make sure that um, that that practices are the way they should be. They need to be looking at transactions and making sure that they have a robust auditing process. Um, and then they get also involved in risk rounds. And that's another component. And I, again, can send you all a checklist um, that I have made up for um, doing diversion risk rounds. And what those are, just, just briefly, it's just rounding within the facility to assess for risk. It's really a, a modeled after what I do when I'm on site at a facility. And that is, I'm going to be looking at where controlled substances are ordered, where they are received, and what those processes are. Um, and how they're transported, and how they're used, how they're wasted, and how they're returned to a reverse distributor out of the pharmacy. Uh, I'm looking at that whole spectrum, and um, I'm also assessing for staff understanding and workarounds and, and, and frank barriers to their ability to, to comply with controlled substance security requirements. So I do a lot of talking with staff, and, and in risk rounds, that's what I suggest. Um, asking staff, if I wanted to steal medication on this floor, where would I go? Um, if you were concerned about a colleague, what would you do? If you came upon a vial and the, the top fell off, how would you react? Uh, so we want to talk with staff and, and we want to do it in a non-threatening way. These are meant to be process improvement rounds, not um, punitive rounds. Here is just a sample uh, diversion oversight committee membership list. Uh, you can see we have a lot of folks involved, uh, and every institution is different. There may be people who need to be on this committee that aren't listed here, and there may be some listed here that, that wouldn't be relevant. Um, just a few points here. Um, security many times can be um, really, really, really helpful in these investigations. They're trained to be involved in these types of things many times, not always, um, and it's something that every facility should consider whether whether um, they could include security and have them help um, shoulder the, the load of addressing drug diversion within the facility. Um, Compliance does need to be involved because these are typically um, regulatory type issues. Infection prevention. So I will just say that in my model of a diversion program, I strongly recommend that facilities consider reporting all diversion cases to infection prevention. They can blind some of the personal private details, but infection prevention needs to be aware when diversion is happening so that they can um, be on the alert for signs that patients may have um, been harmed, um, namely by um, contracting some type of bloodborne pathogen. Uh, one facility that I work with, we report all diversion cases uh, to infection prevention, and they keep track of those patients that may potentially have been exposed to make sure there aren't signs that something um, is going on in those particular patients. This is really important when you consider some of the cases across the country that have happened. Um, many times when there's a case of tampering and substitution, um, public health officials have to get involved if there's a risk of exposure to patients. And um, I work with public health officials a lot, and they tell me that when they go to infection prevention, uh, personnel within the facility, that they have no idea 
what happened. They were never part of this equation um, at the front end. Uh, and, and, and I think it's vital that they be looking to make sure that we aren't starting to see signs that patients um, on a unit where an injectable diversion occurred are starting to show signs of um, infection. Human resources is, of course, um, uh, a given. And then we also see internal audit. There are billing issues in these cases. There may be regulatory billing issues like 340B and um, GPO compliance. So these are things that we want um, internal audits, internal audits to weigh in on. Um, laboratory may or may not be a principal member of the diversion committee, but certainly would be ad hoc uh, because most facilities are constantly um, looking at their drug screening processes and trying to make determinations about how to handle that best. And if you have research, human subject research, animal research that you are responsible for as an institution, um, that is another area that is that is very commonly um, plagued by diversion issues or at least lack of security. And so the, that's an, a, a department you would want to engage as well. So in the formal program, there's shared responsibilities between key departments. This is not a nursing issue. This is not a pharmacy issue. Although nursing and pharmacy will typically take the lead, this is an issue that, that we have a lot of experts um, within a facility that can help with. Um, we want to have policies to prevent, detect, and properly respond to diversion. And so one of the things I encourage facilities to do is to take a look as you're beginning your diversion program. Look at your policies and see if they really say what you think they say. Um, for example, many times I will solicit these policies before I go on site, and that will be the moment when the director of pharmacy will say, well, I thought our policy was that people were supposed to waste here, um, but in fact, our policy is very nonspecific. I, they don't know where they're supposed to waste, quite frankly. Um, so we want to make sure that the policies reflect what we expect in practice. Um, a method of auditing, and most facilities do have that. They are looking at controlled substance transactions, but it isn't necessarily a given. Uh, I have encountered facilities who have gotten so overwhelmed by the auditing process that they're doing very, very little. And there may be, even if you have auditing going on, you may not be doing it in a robust fashion. You may be missing, for instance, areas that have manual um, record keeping and transactions. Prompt attention to suspicious data is important to protect staff and safety. One facility that I work with took time to review something very carefully. Um, it, it arose on a Thursday, the weekend came, and by Monday, the staff member who was suspected of diverting had actually overdosed. Fortunately, um, he did not die, but he had overdosed. So we really want to take um, make sure that these are priority issues. And I can tell you I've come into facilities many times in the middle of the night um, to address something that has arisen. So I think it's important to realize that time is of the essence. A collaborative relationship with external agencies. Many facilities I work with are fearful of regulatory agencies. They're fearful of the DEA, and they may not have been reporting um, theft as they should have to the DEA. Um, and I, my recommendation is, as you're starting a program, before you have a case, um, at a time when you don't have a case, reach out and, and tell, you know, get to know who, who you'll be reporting to. Um, find out where your FDA Office of Criminal Investigations is in your area and who would you be calling um, and what's the name of the person? How do you get in touch with them? Reaching out when you don't have a case and just letting them know we have a very, um, uh, we are very dedicated to this issue. We have now formed this, this program and we will be reporting more. And I, we want you to know that, that we have a common goal. It's nothing to be alarmed about, but we are now going to, you're going to be seeing more from us because, um, we have an, a, a, an ongoing, um, consistent approach to this and we are going to be addressing it head on. And then the big one is education for literally all staff. So even, Non-clinical staff need to have some level of education. It can be brief, um, but I recommend education at onboarding as well as annually. Um, don't forget anesthesia. They have different workflows. They have, can have their own um, specialized education. Physician office practices, those folks really need a lot of education as well because 
the things that they are facing in the outpatient setting are very risky, but very different from what we see in the inpatient setting in many ways. So it's important for us to support and educate staff to be aware of their own vulnerabilities. We want to prevent staff from going down this road if we can and offer them options, things that they can, places they can reach out if they start to find themselves in a situation where they may go down this path. We want to encourage staff to seek help before they commit a crime and remind them of the things that are out there, the, the options that are out there, including um, state-run professional um, rehabilitation programs or assistance programs, as well as um, EAP and other options that may be available in your particular workplace. We want to make sure that we develop a culture of safety by holding each other accountable, um, and that means instances like wasting. Um, I can tell you across the country what we hear from nurses is I don't visually witness my colleague wasting, particularly if I know him or her well. Um, if, it's a, if it's somebody who's floated to the unit or maybe a traveler, I don't. Um, but, um, I mean, I do, but, it, but if it's someone I know, I, I won't. Um, so holding each other accountable is important. We have to be willing to say, no, I'm not going to sign off on that waste because I didn't see you actually physically destroy it. Um, and we want to work towards that culture of security, accountability, and reporting. Some of the bigger challenges. Um, so overall, a lack of awareness among staff. Um, complacency in some, in some areas we oftentimes will see. And then pushback. No, I've always done it this way. It's going to be too hard for me to change my practice. Anesthesia is always difficult. We were talking about this before the, before the webinar. Um, it, it's a difficult group to, to surveil. It's a gr difficult um, a group and a difficult workflow to, to have secure processes in place. Um, and so anesthesia certainly requires extra attention and special um, special processes. Uh, it, this handling drug security and diversion is not a one size fits all model and so we have to we have to adjust depending on what the workflows are. What we see in anesthesia oftentimes is lack of security um, because they need to have these drugs immediately available. So we need to provide them with the best possible secure options. Um, poor accountability um, largely when, when staff are using um, kits and things like that, we may not be able to really um, have accountability for what's going on. We may see that there's a propensity to hand drugs from one provider to another as they're relieving each other and it becomes very difficult to identify where diversion happened if it did. Um, this is a quote from one of my clients, so I put it in um, that sometimes um, anesthesia providers may feel that they really have things, you know, unique in their environment and that they're in control. Um, transporting controlled substances is always problematic for anesthesia providers because they do, by the nature of their work, oftentimes have to do that. Um, dilution of controlled substances can make it difficult to detect diversion, particularly if you're, tam if you're testing um, anesthesia waste. And then without having in room automation in the ORs and procedural areas, meaningful auditing is very labor intensive and can become almost impossible. Challenges in the pharmacy, um, closed loop reporting. And what I mean by that is we want to make sure that everything that, that leaves the pharmacy actually makes it to where it's supposed to go. And anything that's pulled, uh, let's say it's expired out of a drug cabinet on the floor, actually comes back to the pharmacy. There is little ability to do meaningful, meaningful surveillance aside from this closed loop report, which is usually available in, in most institutions. So at least doing that closed loop report. Um, expired stock can be an area um, that is very susceptible to diversion and isn't, isn't well accounted for. I was just on site at a facility that um, realized that they had some, some um, hydromorphone PCAs that were that were recalled by the manufacturer and they had been put aside, but it hadn't really been checked into the inventory because they, they were going to be returning them very quickly um, to the manufacturer. But, but the problem was that that never happened. And so these were there and unaccounted for virtually in their, in their um, stock. Patient specific controlled substance security and tracking is also difficult because those types of um, compounded items um, typically are outside of the automation 
um, realm, and so they're manual records. And then just re basic record keeping and registration issues we see many facilities struggling with. Um, procedural areas, pulling too much medication before a case because they're worried that they may need it and they may not have um, access readily during the case. Um, pulling medications way too early, um, again, lack of security. Um, excessive returning and wasting of medications because they've pulled too much, and a lack of security during the procedure. The bottom line is the longer the controlled substances are out of secure storage, the likelier the diversion becomes or loss. So we want to make sure that we provide good options for them. Um, monitoring clinical staff, sometimes we do see a nursing pharmacy disconnect. At my, at my own facility that I worked at before I became a consultant, when we first started the program, we realized that nursing thought the pharmacy was doing a lot of things and pharmacy thought nursing was doing those things. And so there was a, a, a disconnect that we needed to work on. Um, not having active surveillance or um, auditing of drug cabinet transactions and not having analytics reports that can facilitate that surveillance. Um, ownership, who, who is responsible for that? And then having good resources and a, and a defined approach to how you will audit transactions and address detection of diversion. And then don't forget special challenges like outpatient settings. Clinics, physician office practices, ambulatory surgery centers can be very um, different in, in how they are handling controlled substances. And many times we see prescribing issues and we see even um, just plain prescription issues. So we want to be looking at all of those types of, of um, settings as well. And then um, children's hospitals. I work with a number of them. I'm my, myself, I'm a pediatric intensive care nurse. My husband's a pediatric um, infectious disease doctor and at children's hospitals are near and dear to me. But we oftentimes find that they may have a propensity to say, we have kids here this is these our our patient population requires very caring providers. It couldn't possibly happen here, and the reality is it absolutely happens in children's hospitals. They are taking care of children. They are not hiring children, and um, quite frankly, the doses are not too small to divert. And we've seen that um, play out many times. So. As you launch your program, approach it as a patient, staff, and community safety issue. Um, make sure you have a comprehensive and sustained effort. This does not get fixed, so it will be a sustained effort. Widespread education at the outset so that staff understand why you're going to be asking them to do some things they may not have had to do before. Um, having a committee to help kickstart the program. One facility I'm working with, we've, we've developed a pharmacy committee a nursing committee and an anesthesia committee to get started with so that we can address each address our goals in the, each of those various areas. We want to prioritize goals. This is overwhelming. Um, and so we really have to have a, have a, a, a prioritization or we can become very, very much lost in the detail and have appropriate resources. When surveillance is an ongoing, diverters do become very smart. So if you haven't had that happening, you need to be aware, you need to be prepared because um, many times when facilities ramp up a program, they find a lot. So in, to wrap up um, some of the key points, this does happen everywhere and is far more recognized, uh, far more um, common than it is recognized or reported. Uh, diverters aren't necessarily recognizable by appearance or behavioral signs. Um, every institution certainly needs a formal program to prevent, detect, and respond. Be aware of tampering, and regular staff education is key to reducing the risks of patients and the institution. And I'll turn it back over to you, Chuck. Kim, fantastic. That was just a terrific, uh, terrific uh, uh, overview. And in order to be on time, I'm going to just start the, uh, the survey, which will go on in the background as we have our reactors comment. And I've got some questions for you that are kind of burning in the back of my mind, but I want to start with uh, Chief Adcox, who is uh, uh, Bill Adcox, who actually there would be no MedTAC program without the chief, and, uh, and he is, uh, uh, is really becoming one of our stars, I think, globally in this whole new model of threat safety science, along with Dr. Boats, in identifying threats, risk, harm, uh, and uh, has had uh, extra training at Wharton Business School, and I think it's one of our really uh, amazing leaders at MD Anderson, one of our leading cancer centers in the world. Chief, uh, do you want to comment, and, 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 and then we'll go to Greg? Chief, are you, uh, are you muted? 
I'm here. No, I'm here. You, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much. And also, Kim, uh, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. First off, let me say how excited uh, I am to be part of and uh, connected to the MedTAC uh, operation and, and program. Uh, you know, we've gotten, we've moved past this, you know, highly charged events is what we focus on to what are the actual causes of preventable deaths. And when you think about it, it's, it's not only the secondary prevention that, that this is with, but it also puts into focus primary prevention where we can fix a lot of the problems that are, that are causing these preventable deaths. So MedTAC is, is just great to be part of that. But when we talk about uh, drug diversion, um, it is very critical for all of us in the security realm, the chief security officer, as well as the executives, the clinical staff, everybody to come together and understand that this is happening and it's very, very critical. I just want to say that I believe we're in a perfect storm because when you think about uh, the physicians now with all the regulations and the crackdown are actually uh, changing their methodologies as they prescribe. Uh, they're, they're, they're following their patients closer. At the same time that that's going on, you're, you're seeing that uh, seizures of fentanyl are up, uh, overdose deaths are up. In fact, uh, fentanyl is much easier now to even mail. The primary source being China and it's being mailed in. 60% uh, of all the international mail comes through the JFK and their seizures are up a thousand percent over the last couple of years. And what we're seeing is, is that it takes a very small amount, which is very powerful, so it's, it's very easy to manufacture, it's very cheap and the high profits. And so we're, you're going to see it's a perfect storm now that we're cutting off the, the prescription area a little bit, and now you're seeing these, these other folks. So if you think about drug diversion, uh, this is where there, there's access to whatever they need to get. So to my opinion, the problem's only getting worse. And going back to what Ken says, to, to me it's the analogy of the barrel. So is, is, it, is, it, is, it a, is it a bad barrel that's, that's causing the apple to be bad or a bad apple that creates a bad barrel? Well, the truth of it is is that for us to have a true solid ecosystem, we need to have a clean, transparent barrel and making sure that that way we can easily see the, the apple that may be a little bit corrupt and get it, get it taken care of and get it some help. But at the same token, a clean, transparent barrel means all the new individuals coming in are going to, Going to be going to be good shape. They're going to be seen in an ecosystem that expects accountability. It expects us to focus on what doing the right thing. And, and to me, it's called we, we've got to coin the phrase. It's a preventable ethical maintenance. And if we do that, we should have some success. Um, multidisciplinary approach. All of us in it together. It is it is truly a, a an organizational health individual wellness approach. It's not a criminal justice prosecution approach, but I will tell you that prosecutional uh, is a is a tool. A lot of times you have to get to the point where a person takes the choice of either going down the criminal side or going and getting help. So it's a great tool to ensure that we can help our employees. And if we're all in this together and it's a holistic approach and you think about the, the, the transparent clean barrel as an ecosystem, I think we can be successful. And, um, and I thank Kim and I thank, uh, uh, the organization is putting this on today because drug diversion is truly, truly a horrible problem with the epidemics of opiates today. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks so much, Bill. And I just want to remind everybody that uh, you can come back and watch the entire webinar, which will be uh, posted for future viewing. Some of Kim's slides are, are, are protected and could not be in the deck. So we just want to remind you, but they will be on the video. So you can go back for those. Greg, would you uh, like to comment, please, sir? Uh, absolutely, Chuck. Kim, thank you for a fantastic presentation on uh, an aspect of the opiate epidemic that is sort of under the waterline of the uh, the iceberg that's facing us with opiates in the in our country. But I joined this uh, webinar group uh, uh, a year or so ago, and one of the topics that I was very passionate about was the opiate uh, overdose epidemic in our communities, and that our focus has been on patient safety for many years, and we've tried to broaden our focus to include our caregivers and our caregivers' family and community because of the effects of uh, all of these threats and risks to to our um, healthcare environment. But this gets very personal for me because in the 25 years that I've been a practicing anesthesiologist, um, I've lost five colleagues to opiate overdoses. And many of them, I had no idea that they were diverting or using. 
and their personal and uh, professional tragedies that are happening in our communities um, that are entirely preventable, that are entirely um, able to be uh, maybe diverted into a different pathway where someone can get help. Um, perhaps they won't practice in that uh, in that environment again, but they can still contribute to healthcare, to our uh, healthcare community, um, but we don't lose them from from our professional lives, from our personal lives, from their family lives. This is a truly a personal human tragedy that's happening in our healthcare environment, and anything that we can do to identify it, to detect it, to prevent it, and to remediate it, I'm all in. Fantastic, Greg, and, and uh, uh, Dan, we'll give you extra time at the end to not only make your comments, but also close us. I'm just watching our time to be sensitive to everyone. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, first off, Kim, thank you. Tremendous, tremendous uh, 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 and insightful work, and I want to remind everybody to read the articles that you've allowed us to post. Uh, can you answer two quick questions? One of them is, what what are that you're an attorney as well as a nurse as well as somebody who's who's uh, knows this topic very well? What are the crimes that are committed? What are the legal issues regarding somebody that uh, diverts? And what do we need to know about the crimes? Because we're kind of trying to sort out harm, risk, threats, and then crimes which are jurisdictional are there there common things across the entire United States that are the the crime related to this and that's uh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, question uh, number one and number two how do we protect the whistleblowers who may know something's going on but not want to draw fire either from above because we know that's a really really big big threat right now that people feel that there would be retaliation from their leaders who don't want to know about something bad going on uh, and also from their colleagues. Uh, so the two quick questions, what are the crimes or what is the federal or what, how would you describe to us the risk for the crimes? And then two, how do we protect the whistleblowers who just want to do the right thing by their patients but don't want to draw fire? Uh, great questions. So as far as <clears throat> Excuse me. As far as um, as far as the crimes go, uh, tampering with a consumer product is one, and then just frank theft. Many people think about <clears throat> diversion as as loss, and when they're looking at reporting to the DEA, diversion is theft, and so it's always reported to the DEA. So I think those are the two big ones without going into a lot of detail. Um, we also see trafficking charges depending on what's going on. As far as um, protecting individuals who want to report something. Many facilities have taken the approach that they'll have a hotline, and I think that's important. I think that's great to do because it does sometimes encourage anonymous reporting where the individual might not report otherwise. The only caveat to that is I think that facilities need to be aware if you have a hotline for reporting these types of concerns, it needs to be monitored around the clock. It can't be an, an, a, a compliance line, for instance, that you know someone goes home on Friday afternoon at 4 p.m., and we don't take the messages off until um, Monday, you know, midday. We want to make sure that it's monitored around the clock because the worst scenario is to have someone report um, suspected diversion or even frank impairment and us not take action, Let, allow that provider to continue in that behavior and be exposed to patients over the course of several days. So, so uh, we're aware of cases where impaired caregivers oh have yeah. acted improperly because they were impaired, mm -hmm. led to a malpractice suit, and then all of a sudden uh -huh. the clamp goes down on all the information and people are very afraid of talking because they know there's some pending litigation. Yeah, that's that's definitely true, and that can certainly put a, um, you know, a, 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 a hush on everything that goes on within the institution. I think we need to... Um, really emphasize, though, that this is, this is a patient safety issue, and this is something that we can discuss in appropriate ways, um, and that we that we have a professional responsibility to address um, as caregivers. Great. Well, listen, Dan. Let's give you a generous time to both make your comments, but then also would you close us, Dan? And I'd like to thank everyone, uh, and I'll make my final thanks after Dan speaks. But Dan. Your comments on what you heard, and uh, and then also, would you close us? I appreciate that. Yes, I will do that. Um, Suck is a former healthcare consultant in the field, and for a number of years now, is a safety advocate because of the tragedy I mentioned earlier. 
I, I, I am disgusted by the CYA activity that is so common in our field, unfortunately, to cover your ass um, when we, that's not why we're there. Uh, things happen. I understand that. I'm, I, at my desk here, I, I have a copy of the National Geographic of June 2017, and the article in there is Why We Lie. And I'm really curious about the why is of why people get into the opioids, and then which leads to the kind of things we're talking about here. Um, separate subject is the patient is typically the most mindful person in the room, and Kim, I would strongly encourage inviting one or more patients as or family members as the voice of the patient, as members of the diversion uh, uh, committee membership. Uh, another subject, I am a veteran, and this issue of impacting uh, the return of veterans troubles me greatly. It, it has ever since I came back from Vietnam. I was in the Navy. I was a naval aviator. And it didn't bother me as it did a lot of the, the guys on the ground in the Army, the Marines, et cetera. It just came back with horrible situations. The VA can't do it alone, and every single organization in the country has to deal with it. Um, Lastly, I can't help but think about this relates to the first point I talked about with the CYA piece. Uh, we really have to connect the dots of patient and staff safety, transparency, and impaired providers. Uh, patient harm is tragic. Uh, the staff harm is tragic. We got to swallow our pride and our egos. Uh, the, with terrorism these days, we talk about see something, say something. We got to do the same thing here. Um, Kim, thank you very much. That was a focused, passionate uh, presentation. Uh, uh, you are absolutely remarkable, and your voice in this area is absolutely crucial to just keep speaking about this. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. Uh, we'll be adding more uh, materials to this page. Please fill out the, the survey so we know if you want more on this topic. And, uh, and, and thank you very much. If the speakers could just stay on for just a minute, we'll do a quick performance improvement loop on what we could add to the page uh, uh, for the attendees that come back and, uh, and also a quick process improvement loop. Uh, God bless all of you. I hope you have a great month. And next uh, month, we'll be covering uh, electronic healthcare record related errors harm, cybersecurity, cybercrime in the space of, uh, of HR and the medical records. Thanks very much.